all my life, I've been asked two questions. The first question always is, what country are you from? And that's because I was born profoundly deaf, and I speak with a deaf accent. The second question, what race are you? And it's always the second question that proved to be the most troubling. Some ask me which race I really belong to, or others break my race down into fraction. And when some people see my skin color, why do they doubt that I'm telling the truth? Or call me an invisible minority? But what I really don't understand is why some people ask me if I'm a different race than my own two kids, Jack and June. Why this race seems to matter so much. What is the mist? A mist? I grew up in an incredibly diverse world. Everybody came to our dinner table. What mattered was not what we were born into, but who we were as individuals. What I didn't know growing up was that my upbringing would clash with today's identity policies. My race does not fit into a box. What about my kids, who were even more mixed than me? The growth of the multiracial population in America is, is uh, effectively a time bomb. The population is, is essentially changing from a series of categories to a continuum, and the multiracials represent that continuum. Racism is over! Black! Your skin color! Are you an African American woman? Identify as black. Racism has no part in that flag. Slavery continued in a new Jim Crow. Damn it, let's get time. Murder is a crime. 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 Where do the multiracials fit into this America? Today's multiracials are really in a very interesting and exciting place, but also a place that for the moment is problematic. Do they try to move beyond America's historical obsession with race boxes in hopes of moving toward a better future? Or not? I'm looked at by not only just society, but the government, um, pretty much politicians, as a dangerous individual because of the fact that I refuse to go by what society's standards are. By choosing to be mixed race and choosing to not identify as black or white makes America a little bit uneasy. Some people do find it a bit laughable when you meet somebody, especially black Americans again, and they say, I'm not black, I'm mixed. And you're looking at them and you're like, baby, really? Once again, programmed to identify with something. I'm not one or the other, I'm this space in between. Race is not an individual choice in America, it is a social choice. A lot of people know those say that I'm denying my race. They use the term multiracial or biracial to distance themselves from blackness. So what are you? You know, like that's the question. That's always the question. What are you? I'm a human being. I'm Angie McKee. I'm a mixed race individual. That means I have two awesome cultures that have made me who I am. It's, it's very tempting to just say, let's just forget it. I'm a human being. I don't think we as a nation are there yet. They want to stay stuck into the norm of what we're used to. My mother actually wouldn't date my dad for two years because he was white. My dad's family in South Dakota, German and Irish, farmers and teachers. So my mother's side of the family, they were slaves in Texas. She was raised in a time period where segregation was a very real thing in her life in Houston. 
And so going to DC and working with my dad at the Justice Department, my mom was one of the first black people my dad had ever met. But in that two years, she got to know him and become friends with him and realized that there was no reason why she shouldn't date him because he was white. Finally started dating and it was love and he created a little mixed baby. <laughs> you know, you know um, I always tell the story of my grandmother taking my brother and I to the dollar store and how she taught us from a very young age, you don't touch anything in the store. You walk in, you can look at it, but you don't touch anything unless you're buying it. One day my grandmother got totally frustrated with the guy following us. We had proven ourselves to be honest people, but that day she was just like, I'm done with this. Touch everything. Pick it up, carry it around, you know, do whatever you want to do. I, I totally attribute this to my being raised by a black mother and a white father, that if I were to become angry at all white people for the way one ignorant shopkeeper treated me, then I would also be angry at my father. And that man has done nothing ever in his life against a person of color. Dear President Obama, you were the epitome of what positive things can happen from change. However, Mr. President, I have been disappointed about the message given to millions of multiracial people. If you are multiracial, you have to choose to be of one race. I wrote the letters simply based on the fact that President Obama said that when he used to ride around the South Side streets of Chicago, people in the community would see him as black. So he decided to identify himself as black. You're saying I'm not black or white, I'm biracial. That's, that's a tough concept for most of us too, because we've been kind of trained to put someone in a category. We're too busy living our life through others. My teacher, Miss Nelson in third grade, asked all the black kids to stand up. I stood up. She asked the Asian kids to stand up. I sat down. Then she asked the white kids to stand up. I stood back up again, got a couple cracks. President Obama, we cannot go back to the one drop of black blood rule. Our ancestors have fought so hard. My grandmother, she even identifies me as being multiracial. She fought for that. She went through the times of, you know, out there picking cotton or couldn't use a certain bathrooms. And it kills her sometimes to even see that we still are a society built on race. President Obama, now is your chance. For that is the true genius of America, that America can change. Respectfully, Eric C. Jaskowski, United States Army. The idea of people from multiple races choosing their own identity, like Eric and Angie, is a fairly new one. Eli's grandfather couldn't do that. Eli's own father, born to a white mother and a black father, did not have that freedom. Until very recently, any person with one drop of black blood was black. In America's beginning, there was race mixing, especially among indentured servants and slaves. In 1676, during Bacon's Rebellion, these blacks and whites fought the white ruling class holding them in bondage and lost. To prevent future rebellions, the ruling class introduced one of the earliest variations of the one drop of black blood rule, transforming a class-based society into a race-based society. The purpose of the rule was to, dis to make clear distinctions between black people and white people. Well, I may not ever be on the bottom down there with you because I'll never be a black person, but I can certainly have some sort of prestige or social status psychologically for being white. Interracial unions were outlawed. Those with a drop of black blood were pushed into the black. This one drop rule defined slavery and entrenched the laws of segregation until the civil rights movement destroyed those laws. But not the one drop rule, which reinvented itself into the five primary race boxes used by identity politics in its quest for racial justice. This is why Eric and Angie are dangerous, make America uneasy. They threaten the very structural underpinnings of today's race-based society by refusing to fit into the rigid race boxes. Even the recent additions of multiracial boxes seem to hold a little truth for them. I, I've always had issues with these boxes because when I check all that apply, 
I feel like all of a sudden I become just African American in terms of their statistics. It's almost like the Wizard of Oz, and we want to know after we've checked, you know, maybe five or six boxes, like I would. What happens when I mail that back behind the curtain? And they pretty much boil it down to one. And some folks have said, "Well, what does it mean, though, that that when you re-aggregate the data for civil rights monitoring and anti-discrimination enforcement?" that you essentially negate the fact that they checked more than one. And my, my reading of it is, they did it for this purpose. It's, you're right, they did negate your answer on this part, but they did it so they could do this. And, and the short answer is, because it's messy, because it's incomplete, because it's imperfect. If someone wants to identify me as naive because I choose to identify as human rather than as a particular race. I find that very offensive. My generation is just the start. This country, we need to stand up and follow exactly what we're supposed to be all about. Um, that's the reason why we have people from other countries who want to come here. Many multiracials are content to remain within the framework of identity politics. Eric and Angie are holding on to a vision that they learned in their American childhoods. That race holds very little truth. What it does hold is power. At a bother, the question becomes, which path do I teach Jack and June to take? Do I teach them to embrace identity politics, game the system, or do I teach them to embrace the full humanity, the full individuality? Perhaps the answer to the question lies in the past. At the boy, I thought that my grandfather was a racist. He objected to my mother, Mary, my father. My mother's stepmother slapped my father in the face. I couldn't understand how a Jew targeted by Nazis for his own race could do this. My father was a survivor. My mother was a survivor who then died when I was two. They had suffered immeasurably at the hands of non-Jews. And that was still very much in their consciousness. They did not want to lose any more people in the Jewish community. They believed they had an obligation to carry um, Judaism on. And the reason he wanted to come to America was one thing and one thing only. He believed that America was the place of freedom and opportunity. I think to anyone that believes in those ideas, they're ideas until you experience them in day-to-day -day realities. So growing up in Rodham, freedom and opportunity might have meant to my father being able to uh, get a job, eat three meals a day and be left alone. To me, growing up in America, freedom and opportunity meant that I could join America, meet all kinds of people that my father would not have even been able to imagine. The rejection by my own family for marrying a non-Jew, and my husband always said for marrying a black. That alienation was an extreme consequence that I actually had not expected from my own family. I thought their humanity would trump everything. I was not the first person in my family to go through this. Uh, my mother's parents, my grandparents, tried to talk her out of getting, getting married to my father. 
1944. It was a pretty radical, it was a pretty radical thing to do. All of her si siblings left, uh, abandoned her, and never came back, ever. If there was something wrong with my father, that would be another story. But there wasn't, they had no, it was just that he was black. I remember when I was about four or five years old, sitting on, uh, on the floor playing uh, with a train set or something, and my mother got a phone call. It was from my grandparents, and they had been, they had been gone for about six years by then. She had had no, no contact at all. They said, we're down the street. We would very much like to come and visit if that's okay with you. So I remember how, how excited she was. Uh, and she fluttered around and, <laughs> uh, and we were excited that she, your grandparents are coming to see you. They were really just good people. They had a moral conscience. They were Northerners. They knew that segregation was an evil thing. They had never raised my, my mother to be prejudiced. They would not allow um, that kind of language. Um, so they, they, all, they had a sense of consciousness, and so they, they had, in a sense, betrayed themselves. And, and they set that right. Well, it took my father about 15 years to come back around. I think on a certain level, he truly understood that these categories did not matter so much. I think he wanted to know his daughter again, and I think he wanted to know his grandchildren. And so one day he made the decision to come out, and um, he uh, got off the plane and shook my husband's hand and became the grandfather that we always wanted and needed. Jack and Jean's ancestors had not overcome the difference and thought the humanity of one another. Then Jack and Jean, or even I, would not exist in today's world. Why would Jack and Jean do anything other than embrace their full and rich legacy, one that gave birth to them? And what of society is today? Should we stop putting people into race boxes? What is the price that we pay for doing stuff, especially those of us who are multiracial? Isn't it time to call us who we truly are? Americans? Individuals? Humans?